Well, I'm tired and weary, but I must be going on till the Lord comes and calls me away. Well, the morning's so bright and the Lamb is alive and the night Night is as black as can be, oh Lord. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me. There'll be no sadness no sorrow, no trouble I'll see, nothing but peace in the valley for me. Well, the bear will be gentle, and the wolf will be tame, and the lion shall lay down by the lamb and the beast from the wild shall be led by a child and I'll be changed changed from this creature that I am and there will be peace in the valley for me Someday there will be peace in the valley for me. There'll be no sadness, no sorrow, no trouble I'll see. Nothing but peace in the valley for me. Take your Bible with me this afternoon and open to the book of Isaiah, chapter 56. We come in our study to uh, the middle chapters of the book of Isaiah, and uh, we've looked at a lot of different thoughts in the book, and there's a lot of important doctrinal teachings for us and uh, the Lord promises all that uh, seek him will be blessed if you look at uh, chapter 55 verse 6 it says seek ye the Lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he is near let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is omniscient, omnipotent, he is sovereign. Uh, he knows all things. He's, he's omnipresent at all times. Uh, this is the nature of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Godhead. And the Father has given all glory to the Son and uh, has exalted Him and given Him a name that is above every name that at his name every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. In chapter 55, verse 13, he said, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And the Lord is making futuristic promises of his blessings upon 
all nations and especially upon uh, his uh, spiritual Israel, those that put their trust in him. And when we come to chapter 56, from chapter 56 through 59, uh, he talks about two topics in particular. Salvation is a promised blessing for the nations and that judgment will come upon the wicked. Notice verse 1 of 56. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgments and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is a man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing many any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuch that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And here he's referring to eunuchs who had become eunuchs for the kingdom of God. And uh, they had made a vow that they would not have any kind of relationships either with men or women and the Lord promised them that they would be blessed and that he would bless them far beyond uh, just having children because they would uh, follow the Lord and be blessed. He says in verse 7, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God which gathereth the outcast of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. In other words, the Lord has an elect people throughout the world. Even though this was written about uh, 3,000 years ago, uh, and it was written to the physical nation of Israel, the Lord makes promises to all nations that all nations that hear the gospel will be blessed and will follow Him. Verse 9, All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind, they are ignorant, they are all dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain from his quarter. <clears throat> uh, long time ago I preached a sermon about dogs I've known from this passage. You know, the Bible talks a lot about different dogs, uh, moreover the dog uh, a lot of people you know cutting up they'll say that he was the first dog that was named in the Bible moreover but uh, it, was, it was just talking about the dog and the fact that uh, he licked the sores and the Lord uh, blessed the man and the, the healing of the dog brought about a medicine and a cure but uh, anyway he's talking about the people that they're blind they're ignorant, they're dumb dogs, they cannot bark, they, they just lie around, they slumber, and they're greedy. Never can have enough. Come ye say they, I will, uh, <clears throat> I will fetch wine, we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. So they tell them that the answer is in the drink. You just keep on drinking and you drink and you drink and get drunk and then tomorrow you'll have more abundance. 
you know, like that the answer for your life's problems is to get drunk and forget them and just keep on drinking. We know there are a lot of people in the world do that, but that is not the answer for our lives. And uh, those that uh, the Bible talks about that attend to the bottle, uh, their eyes are red, they're inflamed. The Bible says that uh, strong drink is a mockery and wine as well. So you would, uh, you know, I'm not saying that there's not wine used in the Lord's Supper, but I'm talking about using alcohol for an intoxicating drink. Uh, you know, all things God has made have a place and a purpose, but we have to make sure we use them for the right things, not to get drunk or uh, to abuse uh, and, and be able to forget our problems. Verse chapter 57, The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away. None consider that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. I heard a lot of people say about different pastors that I know who died and uh, people said, well, I'm glad they didn't have to see what happened uh, to their church or, you know, to the work that they had given their life to, to see how it uh, suffered and how that things went down. Uh, and I guess there's some truth to that, but uh, the Lord knows what he's doing. And the Lord says that in verse 5, inflame yourself with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. And this refers to their worship of Baal and Molech, where they would uh, find a cliff, and there they would go into a cave or something of that nature, and, and they would kill the little children, offer them to the god Molech as a human sacrifice, and uh, this has been found in many places in the Middle East where they have done excavations. They found skeletons of infants. And most of them look to be about a year old. And they did this in the worship of Molech. The bones were burned and charred. And, and so we know what happens when people turn away from the one true God. What's going to happen to America if she continues down the path she's on? She's going to grow more and more corrupt, more and more wicked. Look at what's happened in the last 20 years. Look at the moral decay. Uh, there was a study done uh, by a Christian organization I was reading after and, and uh, talked about how that uh, just 25 years ago, uh, the children that, that were going to college that they interviewed, all of them held to traditional values, you know, like the Ten Commandments. But then they gave them that same test uh, a year or so ago, and there was only something like 20% of them that held to traditional values like the Ten Commandments. Like, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, all these different commandments, uh, the ten are just the beginning. But uh, we see in, in this passage, uh, he addresses the contemporaries with the threat of judgment in chapter 1 through 39. Then he addressed the future exiled generation in chapter 40 through 35. Then he comforted them with the promise that one day there would be restoration and the servant of the Lord, the true Israel, would bring about through his sacrificial sufferings uh, many blessings and exaltation. Now we come to the big picture, chapter 56 through 59, where God opposes the hypocritical and, and welcomes the humble from any nation. Those who are 
hypocrites and full of selfishness and pride, he rejects. But those who walk humbly with the Lord, he blesses. Notice in chapter 57, verse 19, I created the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no place, saith my God, to the wicked. A number of years ago when I was in Bible college, I, was a, I believe I was a senior in Bible college, we had a, a debate at Ashland Avenue Baptist Church between Dr. Henry Morris and a couple professors at UK who were evolutionists. And uh, it was open to anybody who wanted to come. And, of course, I was there, and I was sitting out in the audience, and there were about five or six young men who came to support the uh, evolutionary teachers. And uh, I listened to them, and I wanted to witness to them. So after it was over, they walked out of the parking lot, and I was following them, just trying to, you know, talk to them. And uh, my, the cursing, and you should have heard the stuff they were saying. And I thought, Lord, you know, if I talk to they, these young men, they're just going to curse you. And uh, I couldn't even get a word in edgewise for their vulgarity. And, and I thought, you know, that evolution is not just uh, a wicked doctrine, but when you follow in that lifestyle, it's, it's going to destroy you. It's going to lead you into sin and wickedness, and your, your heart is going to be blinded to the truth. In verse 7, he says, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, and thou cover him, and take thou, take thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine Health shall spring forth speedily, and my righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Uh, Israel needed to show God their righteous seal, that the Lord loved them, and his their true godliness and righteousness they needed to follow. And what does this look like today? Uh, we see in the book of James, uh, it pictures what's going on in our world with the wickedness of people and how they turn from God. Uh, even the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 3 gives a description of human sinfulness he gives a list of all these wicked things in Romans chapter 3. If you'd turn there for just a minute. Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 9. The Bible says, What then are we better than they no, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They've all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Amen. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their sweet, their 
feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And here Paul is summarizing what Isaiah has been saying to the nation. The writing changes from the second person to first person in uh, chapter 59. If you turn with me to chapter 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken uh, lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None called for justice, nor any pleaded for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. You see that Isaiah's point is well taken. The sinfulness of the nation has left them in a hopeless situation. And God observes that there is not one to intercede or to help. For in verse 15 of 29, he says, Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now he's talking about the work of Christ and his intercessory work, the fact that he came to take our place and to take upon us, uh, upon him, our sins, so that we might be justified. Verse 19, So shall they fear thy, the name of the Lord, from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him and the redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression and Jacob saith the Lord as for me this is my covenant with them saith the Lord my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. Here he's talking about the power of the word of God and our beliefs and how that we instill within our children the love of God and the truth of God. And that truth continues on through our children into our grandchildren and into our great-grandchildren. And it continues right on. That's why when Paul wrote to Timothy, he reminded him of the fact that his uh, grandmother and his aunt had been instrumental in helping him to grow and learn about God. You know, all of us here uh, can think back in our childhood about things that our parents and our grandparents did and said that caused us to want to walk with God or made us uh, interested in learning about God. Even though they might have not known the truth, they knew as much about God 
as, uh, as they could, and they tried to commit that to us uh, through way of prayer. I still remember my grandmother praying with me, sitting on her knee and calling out to the Lord. When she'd pray, I'd turn and look at her eyes, and I'd see that her eyes were closed. And I noticed that a lot of people would pray and they wouldn't close their eyes. And as a little boy, I thought, well, they don't really mean it if they don't close their eyes. But I remember when I would see people close their eyes and pray, I thought they really mean business with God. And they're, they're, they're calling out to Him and they believe that He exists. And, and here Isaiah talks about how uh, the seed is blessed from the Word of God. Uh, the Bible commands us that we are to bring our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, uh, Paul talks about how important it is uh, to teach them the gospel, uh, to teach them uh, the Word of God. I remember uh, my, my girls and Adam too, uh, when they were in school, I remember they got up a little bit bigger and, and one of the teachers brought up Calvinism and he didn't know much about it. And my daughter gave him the doctrines of grace, the five points, and, and the teacher just it blew his mind. He said, where in the world did you learn that? And she said, my dad taught that in church and taught me that from the time I was a little girl. And, uh, you know, I've, I've taught all my children the Greek and Hebrew alphabet. I'm teaching my grandchildren now. Every time I get them around me, I try to, you know, introduce them to it where they think about those things and study to help them grow and to achieve great things for God. And uh, that's the one desire we all have is that our children will walk in the ways of the Lord uh, in the book of Psalms 51, uh, David says in Psalm 51, verse 3, uh, something that really will speak to your heart. If I can find it here, Psalm 51 and verse 3, the Bible says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, you know, uh, many times in our life, we, we don't want to be honest with what our sins are. We call them mistakes. You know, we, we think we just kind of slipped up, but the Bible says here, I acknowledge my transgressions. Now, what a transgression is, is to know better and to step over the line. We've all transgressed. We've not only sinned, and we don't not only have iniquity, but we have transgressions. I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Now this was David's prayer after he had been approached by the prophet when he had committed murder and some atrocious crimes against God, and he said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Now you think about that. He sinned against Uriah because he, he took Uriah's wife, and he had Uriah killed. He had him put in the hottest part of the battle, but yet when he prayed, he said, Really? Ultimately, what I've done is I've sinned against God because God is the ultimate record keeper. We may be able to hide from other people, but you cannot hide from God. I used to think when I was a little boy, if I hid my sins from my mom and dad and my grandparents and my sisters, that uh, I'd, I'd get away with it. But I didn't think about the fact that God knew my sins. And then he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. 
That's the nature of man. We were shapen in iniquity. We were shapen in a, a corrupt nature, a depraved nature. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, not that it was a sinful relationship for his mother and dad to be intimate with each other, to have a baby, but because of the nature they both had, it was a sin nature. There was only one man born to parents with no sin nature, and that was Jesus Christ, because he had no earthly father. His father was God. And uh, if you cannot accept the virgin birth and believe that that could happen, then I don't know how you could be saved. Because if God's not big enough for, uh, to have a virgin birth where his son was born, he's not big enough to save us. But he is big enough. And so the sinfulness of Israel left them in a helpless condition. This display of God's character gives hope to those who have continually offended him. God dresses himself as a warrior in chapter 59 of Isaiah and verse uh, 17. Uh, he says uh, these words, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garment of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now what does that remind you of? That reminds you of Ephesians 6 where the Bible says put on the whole armor of God. And uh, we're told that we're to have on the shield, we're to have the shield of faith, we're to have the helmet of, of righteousness or salvation, and we're to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the fiery darts of the devil. So even back here, 3,000 years ago, Isaiah was writing about putting on the whole armor of God. Uh, I do this a lot. When I wake up in the morning, I think about that chapter, and I begin to put on my, my clothing for the, the battle and I pray, Lord, give me a strong faith. Help my head to be shod with salvation, my feet shod with the gospel, and help me to be fully clothed to fight the good fight. And if you were to summarize everything that we have talked about in these uh, chapters, uh, you would see that the Lord gives revival for the humble. He dwells among the humble. Uh, as we read in chapter 57, verse 15, and he does not enjoy being with the exalted or the prideful because this is against him. The Bible tells us that we are to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God in the book of Habakkuk. And if we want to have a, a Christian life that brings glory to God, then walk before the Lord in humility and love those around you, encourage them, and build them up in the faith. We see that God has promised that global salvation would come. In Isaiah 52, the way of salvation would be made through the Lord Jesus Christ. He would come as the Redeemer and would give Himself as a sacrifice for the sins of His people. And the gospel has been sent out to all nations. So all the nations of the world have been blessed because of the glorious gospel. Remember what Jesus said to His disciples in Matthew 28, he said, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Baptize them and then teach them to observe all things. 
And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. That is the responsibility of our church to share Christ and to preach the gospel. We have uh, many different people that we touch through YouTube. I get calls all the time, text all the time from different people that uh, share our page and share the preaching with other people. And no doubt there are people that the Lord saves. Through Isaiah's gracious proclamation of reconciliation, when he said in chapter 57, verse 19, uh, about the peace that would come in Christ, I created the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose water cast up mire and dirt. That's the witness of this lost world. Nothing but trouble, nothing but trials. The Bible says through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father in Ephesians 2.8 and together we await the coming of a new creation for we will dwell together with our God in unending peace, glory, and righteousness. And Isaiah came to proclaim that message of life to all the nations of the world that would hear you see, the gospel is not just for Israel. It's not just for America. The gospel is for all people. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. And I will, I will be a, a well springing up into eternal life. That's what happens when you taste of the water of life. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings. Please be with us, Lord. Help us do your will. Bless, I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.